So particularly in the last couple of years, um, maybe within the last decade, um, scholars have talked about doing an intersectional analysis. And so I want to talk about what such intersectionality means. And I'm going to do this in two ways. One is to talk about the rich intellectual tradition that emerged from the work of Kimberly Crenshaw and how she proposed an idea of intersectionality. And then the second is going to be a little strange. So I'm going to just warn you at the beginning that the second is going to be to try and present you a mathematical model that helps you think through intersectionality. Now, some scholars wouldn't be very happy with my presentation of this mathematical model, but I think it might be helpful for some of you, particularly those of you who have a mathematics background. And if you recall from our methods lectures, from our lectures in methods, where we talked about the linear form of y equals mx plus b, um, and how it is that we can think about the relationships between variables in that way, I'm going to formalize that today in front of you. These two different perspectives are meant to give students who have different backgrounds and ways of coming to understand the world an opportunity to think in different ways about, in some ways, the same idea. And so for some of you, one concept, one presentation, maybe the first half of this lecture, will be a little easier than the other. And that's fine. Um, for me, it's really important that students be provided with different ways to learn and understand things. So with that said, let's dive into what intersectionality is and ask what are some different intersectional perspectives of gender? So intersectionality refers to the ways in which social relations are inexorably linked. That is to say that you can't think about gender without thinking about other kinds of things. And here, there's a kind of visual representation of this to show how gender intersects with other kinds of things, like race and class and sexuality and ability and culture and geography and religion and appearance and language and age and so many other things. Now, this may seem really obvious to you, uh, but it actually has, it's not, typically not so obvious and has profound implications for how it is that we understand the social world and maybe even intervene within it. So the first thing I would note is that often when thinking about gender, um, the default idea is to think about women, which is a very strange thing to do if you think about it, because actually women, they certainly have a gender, but their gendered expressions are quite variable and men also have a gender. And so the study of masculinity should be an absolutely essential part of our approach to thinking about gender. But the other thing that we should realize is that women are very different from one another. In the last lecture, I suggested that it was important to realize that there's more variation within categories than between categories, or that women are more different from one another than they are from men on average. With intersectionality, we can, can begin to expand upon this idea. We can begin to expand upon this idea to see maybe why it is that women are more different from one another than they are for men on average. And here we see that like women have different racial identities. They have different class backgrounds. They have different sexualities. They have different abilities. They have different geographies. They have different cultures. They have different national backgrounds. They look different. They, have, they speak different languages. They have different ages. And so all of those other differences create a much greater difference degree of difference within the category of women versus between women and men. We could say the same thing, not just about gender, but about every category. If we take working class people, we should quickly realize that working class people are more different from one another than they are on average different from, say, middle class people. Why? 
Because working class people have different ages. They have different races. They have different sexualities. They have different genders. They have all of these other differences. And so core here is to think about how it is that categories intersect or overlap with one another and produce considerable differences within the category. Humans have other identities, and the intersections and relations that affect them are absolutely essential to making sense of their experience. Intellectually, this work comes from Kimberly Crenshaw, who actually teaches at Columbia University, where I presently teach, um, and uh, in part, and is really one of the most important and influential scholars um, from my perspective, working over the last uh, 25 years, in part because of her, under, her development of the concept of intersectionality. So the very word is a word that she coined or came up with. And the reason that Crenshaw came up with this term is that Crenshaw, in looking at a range of feminist analysis, said, you know, almost all of this feminist analysis comes from an assumption of whiteness. That is, the sets of claims that are being made about gender and within a feminist framework are deeply tied to an understanding of race. And black women experience their gender quite differently. So let me give you an example of this, an example of someone who built off Crenshaw's analysis in ways to show how black women had very different experiences than white women, and that that was deeply important for understanding um, gender. In other words, we couldn't just take an as gender as an abstract thing that wasn't connected to other things. We also needed to consider something like race. This is gonna be the work of Dorothy Roberts. And Dorothy Roberts is a legal scholar who wrote a book called Killing the Black Body which is about black women's experiences with their own reproductive rights and how it was that societies, um, particularly American societies, had sought to control black women's fertility as a fundamental way in which race was done in America. Roberts makes this point for two reasons. First, she argues that gender scholarship, in particular when it thinks about reproductive rights, has white women as its core assumption, and that white women have very different experiences with their fertility than black women do, in part because of the social organization of gender and of race. And then the second thing that Robert says is that when we think about race in America, the default assumption, particularly when thinking about African Americans, is the male experience, and that often black women's experiences has not been considered in what racial equality looks like. And so Roberts notes how black women's fertility and control over black women's fertility has been a major social program of the United States for centuries. For example, during the time of slavery, which is to say during times periods before the 1850s in the United States for nearly centuries, um, but in particular after the banning of the transatlantic slave trade, that is after um, Europeans no longer participated in trading um, uh, Africans who were sold from the west coast of Africa and sometimes captured um, uh, or um, uh, stolen from the west coast of Africa um, and bringing them over on slave ships over to um, the east coast of the United States um, and uh, the Caribbean and South America. So that was banned. And one of the great challenges was where's the labor supply going to come from? And one of the answers was, well, we need to make sure that black women who are slaves have lots of children and that those children are always slaves. And so it required a kind of legal production of a set of rules. All the children of slaves are subsequently slaves. A racial construction where there was an idea of the indelibility of blackness or Indelibility just means that your blackness could not change. It could never be diluted. So that if you had any racialized black blood within you or ancestry, you were always going to be black. 
And that was a necessary way in which race got constructed because of demands for labor within the South. And that this was experienced in particular by black women because black women were subject to what was called slave breeding or an aggressive programming of making sure that those women had children to reproduce the labor supply. In this case, encouraging black women's fertility was an essential feature of slavery. And Robert says, you know, you can't understand the experience of blackness without making sense of that and making sense of how controlling black women's fertility was very important. Fast forward to today, or, and actually Roberts makes many points along the way uh, across a range of historical moments. But today, the control of black women's fertility looks quite different. And in fact, um, one of the things that Robert points to is how, you know, particularly in the 70s and 80s, but even going back to the 1920s, black women's fertility was seen as a problem because black Americans on average were comparatively poor. And so there was this imagination that like, if we could just get black women to have fewer children, there would be fewer poor people. This was a eugenics approach to race, to seek to limit the number of black people. And what Roberts does is she puts this in deep contrast with the experience of white women, where white women sought to re limit their own fertility for a range of reasons. Um, they didn't want to have as many children. It was a way in which white women might have greater access to labor markets, etc. And so understood the control of their fertility as a pathway towards freedom. And even today in our rhetoric, we think about, some of us think about, the ways in which reproductive choice or the control that women can have over their fertility is an expression of their freedom to choose. So the pro-choice movement is very much about this. What Roberts points out is that that is a very white assumption because for black women, the control of their fertility is not something that's deeply tied with choice. In fact, it's tied with a set of structural conditions, a set of conditions of racial oppression where control over their fertility and in particular limiting their fertility has been part of government programs to limit black women's expression, to limit their capability of expressing themselves or of making choices about having children. And this includes all kinds of things from forced contraceptive use to steril forced sterilization, et cetera. So to take a step back, what Roberts is arguing, building upon the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, is that understanding the ways in which gender and choice work, particularly in relationship to ideas of controlling one's own fertility, requires not just looking at gender, but also looking at race. And that the sets of assumptions that many feminist scholars have made about the workings of fertility and choice have, had built into them a racialized assumption of whiteness, or really primarily applied to the experiences of white women. And so what we need to do is take a more intersectional perspective to realize how that gendered experience of fertility is tied to lots of other things, like race. There's also work um, that um, by Nicola Beisel, uh, um, uh, an, another wonderful scholar who talks about how this is deeply tied to class dynamics. Um, and that working class women had different experiences of their own fertility than um, uh, upper class women. This understanding of the intersections and differences and variations within categories forces us to realize that sometimes when we draw conclusions about, say, gender, we're not really drawing conclusions about gender. We're drawing conclusions about gender as it intersects with other categories that we sometimes don't name and that that is a problem. Now, Another way to think about this, and I'll spend a little less time on this, is to look at intersectionality of um, interactions between groups. In Kimberly Crenshaw's work, um, 
she's particularly interested in cumulative disadvantage or the ways in which, just if we go back for a moment, that if you are a woman who tends to be disadvantaged as compared to men and African-American, which tends to be disadvantaged compared to whites, then you have a kind of cumulative disadvantage. And I think that this is an interesting idea, but I'm going to suggest that it's an empirical claim and that you don't always have cumulative disadvantages. And here I'm going to make two points. The first is to draw upon the work of David Padula, um, a uh, um, sociologist who teaches at Harvard University and has written an interesting paper, which you know I think is really kind of provocative in its findings, that suggests that disadvantages don't always accumulate for intersectionality. And then I'm going to go through um, a mathematical model, how to understand intersectionality beyond the conceptual level. So first, let me describe David Padula's work to you. Padula was a student of Diva Pager, who I introduced in one of our earliest lectures, who did the work on a mark of a criminal record. Um, so her work was about how the effect of a criminal record on um, um, employment, as you may recall, and um, Pager used an experimental analysis. And Padula is going to use an experimental analysis in the work that I'm about to describe to you. And Padula was interested in the intersections of race and sexuality. So he thought to himself, you know, we know that there are racialized differences in terms of wages between blacks and whites. This is um, and can be understood uh, as discrimination, maybe, maybe not. Um, people like me tend to think it is discrimination and thinks that there's a lot of evidence that it is, um, uh, that the difference is, is socially structured in patterned ways that, that are in part the product of discrimination. But whether or not you think it's the product of discrimination, you still have to realize that there's this difference, this racialized difference, and that black men compared to white men experience a disadvantage. Um, they make less money. We also know that there are disadvantages relative to sexuality. So that gay men um, uh, um, can, are experience some degree of discrimination. And in general, their wages are a little bit lower than heterosexual. Padula was interested, though, in the intersections of this phenomenon and wondered, well, what happens for gay black men, as one example? What's the experience of the intersection of those two categories? And so he ran an experiment. And the experiment was in some ways similar to, a little bit different than um, the kinds of audit studies that um, one of his advisors, Diva Pager, did, where he submitted a series of qualifications um, um, of different kinds of men, white men and black men, gay men, and heterosexual men. And um, the ways in which he operationalized race was, I believe, through names so and through some sets of things that indicated race. So, um, you know, it would be um, a racialized name. So some names are, are deeply racialized, which is to say that they're strongly associated with different racial um, identities. Uh, so um, you might pick the name Jamal, for example, which would be heavily racialized as an African-American name, um, as opposed to Chase, um, which would be heavily racialized as a white name. But there were other ways in which he operationalized race on um, people's uh, resumes, which included, you know, being part of a black students organization. Um, so he sent in these resumes, um, and uh, some of them were from black applicants and some of them were from white applicants. And he asked evaluators how much they would pay people based upon their qualifications. So he got some information back about how much they would be paid, and he found, lo and behold, that the same exact people, that is, people with the same exact resume who were black versus white in terms of their names and their um, extracurriculars were paid less, were, were offered less by the evaluators. Secondly, he also made some of the whites gay and some of them heterosexual and some of the um, African-Americans gay and some of them heterosexual. 
And again, he did this by creating signals on the resume among the gay applicants. So the gay applicants would have things like they participated in um, uh, an, an LGBTQ organization. And here, um, again, what Padula found was that the gay applicants were on average offered less than the heterosexual applicants, but with an important caveat. And the caveat that Padula found was that black gay men were actually offered more than black heterosexual men. So the highest wages offered were to white men and then to black gay men and then to white gay men and then to black heterosexual men. It's a very interesting finding. And it points to the importance of an intersexual perspective because the experience of being black is not just an experience of being black. It's an experience of being black, excuse me, but also an experience of being black relative to how race intersects with sexuality. Similarly, the experience of being gay is not just an experience of being gay. It's an experience of being gay in terms of how gayness intersects with things like race and class and other phenomena. But also what Padula found was that the intersection of race and sexuality was not one of cumulative disadvantage, or it was maybe a little bit for white applicants, although it didn't seem to be, but it certainly wasn't for the black gay applicants. And so that the intersection pushed in a different direction rather than cumulative disadvantage. And Padula makes an interesting argument about this. So he doesn't have a ton of evidence for his claims, but he suggests that we might think about this in a particular way, which is that part of the racialized um, uh, discrimination against black men isn't just about their race, but it's also tied to presumptions of their masculinity. So that there's a certain fear of black male masculinity which is to say that blackness intersects with gender and that black men in particular are seen by employers as being problematic, maybe having some sets of things that would make employers concerned. This, again, from my perspective, is deeply discriminatory. But interestingly, that because of sexuality or as blackness intersects with sexuality, the fears of black male masculinity decline, or thought of differently, that the intersection of blackness and gayness helps moderate the fears of black men's masculinity. Now, that's a theory that Padula offers up in, 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 in response to his findings. I don't think he evaluates that as a hypothesis. Instead, it's, it's a consequence of the findings that he has overall that he says we should think more about. Whether or not that's right, I'm not totally sure. I think it's something that we could do a lot more work to evaluate. But for now, I think it's important to recognize the value of an intersectional perspective in making sense of this, and that such intersectional perspectives are not just tied to qualitative work, like we heard from Roberts, but also can be part of quantitative work. And here, I wanna end with a mathematical model. Now, a mathematical model is just a representation of how we think relationships work. And so, in this instance, I'm going to present Padula's findings relative to a kind of mathematical model. Why here are the earnings? They're the dependent variable. They're the thing that we're trying to explain. Um, uh, B1 is just the intercept of the line. So for now, you can totally ignore B0, excuse me. Um, B1, X1 is the slope of the line relative to the variable X1. And we'll call X1 race. So there's going to be two different categories of race in the study, um, black and white. And we're going to say that there's some effect of being black and some effect of being white. X2 in this model, we can think of as sexuality. And here we have two different categories of sexuality. So actually, you know, if you recall all the way back to the methods lecture that I gave, or not sure how recently you listened to it, 
I said that there are different kinds of variables. Race and sexuality are both categorical variables. They're categories of things. And this is going to influence the kind of model that we can run. But we think of X as having two values. X2 is having two values, gay or straight. So here what we're saying is that earnings are explained by a constant, the intercept, we're going to ignore that, plus some effect of race, that is B1, X1, plus some degree of the effect of sexuality, B2, X2. And then what B3, X1, X2 is, is an interaction term or the idea of how it is that race and sexuality interact with one another. And sometimes when we, pro when we do quantitative models within sociology, what we're interested in are these interactions. What is the interaction between race and sexuality such that it has an effect on earnings? And then the E at the end of here is just the error term, some, some degree of error that, that that, that, that will be built into our model. Now, you know, if you're interested in this kind of modeling, I would strongly encourage you to take a statistics course, and in particular, a practical statistics course, one that has you, you work with real data in order to analyze phenomenon in the world. But what it also helps you see is that there is a way in which we can ask is there intersectionality in the quantitative work that we're doing? Is there an interaction between the variables of interest such that that interaction changes our explanation so that the effect that we see of race, the effect that we see of sexuality is partially dependent upon the interaction between race and sexuality? Again, for those of you who are interested in the more mathematical orientation to sociology, this is a different way of thinking about the same idea of intersectionality, which is to say that variables interact with one another and that there's a relationship between potentially race and sexuality that can produce effects in the world. It also suggests that intersectionality is an empirical question. And what I mean by that when I say intersectionality is an empirical question is that it means that sometimes there are interactions between variables, but not always. It's not always the case. And what we'll see again and again when doing social analysis is that there are tendencies, patterns, or thought differently, the world is probabilistic. And what we mean by the world is probabilistic is that there are no guaranteed outcomes. What we have are tools for thinking that we then use in order to evaluate real world empirical phenomenon, real world observations that we generate through a range of methods. For now, what I want you to have left with is the idea that variables intersect with or interact with one another, and that sometimes we make hidden assumptions about those variables. So there are a series of hidden assumptions about gender that we kind of need to challenge, that we need to be clear about and say, actually, when we're making these claims about gender, what we're really making claims about is gender and race in a particular way, and that not all women experience this in this way. It's that I primarily looked at white women, or I primarily looked at Asian women, or I primarily looked at Latino women. And that is what's driving a lot of this. It's not women in general. It's instead women at the intersections of these phenomena. It's a very important thing to realize, and it rests again on the insight that there's almost always, almost always more variation within a category than there is between different categories.